Michigan voters go to the polls this November and CMU Public Broadcasting again brings you Meet the Candidates, the election year series that gives you the chance to meet those seeking state and national office. Hello and welcome to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas, joined this time by John Ruggles. He is the Democratic candidate for the 102nd seat in the Michigan House. Good to see you, sir. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. We always give the first few moments to do as the title says, to meet the candidates, some background information about you, your hometown, and the experience that you're bringing to this campaign. All right. Well, I'm uh, from Remus. Uh, in Macosta County. The district includes Macosta County, a portion of Osceola County, and Wexford County. And I've spent uh, a great deal of time in all of those communities. I came here in 1970 with a poverty program, uh, worked in that for a number of years, and then went to consulting with local units of government, wrote lots of grants, and then did my own private developments uh, from bowling centers to housing projects to whatever. So I have a good business background and an excellent uh, opportunity to serve the people of the 102nd. I come to you today with uh, the first day of autumn with my uh, hunting shirt on, <laughs> waiting for all of those activities this fall. And more importantly, I, uh, I'd like to say my background leads me uh, to service and to care about the people of the district, the unemployed, the uh, teachers of our district and our environment. As a challenger in this race, uh, as you've approached the campaign and then the, the voters, you say that you've had the chance to, to meet in the two counties and into Osceola County as well. What have, what have you and they identified as the key issues of the campaign? It is amazing how many people are struggling and how many people want to see this economy approve. That is a number one issue, Dave. It's the absolute number one issue. We have to get this economy going. We have to improve it. We have a way higher unemployment rate up here in the 102nd than we do in the state or in the nation. And we've got to bring jobs to the community. That's why I'm, my proposal is, if we're gonna fix roads and we're gonna fix bridges, and we certainly need to do that, we need to spend a billion dollars to do that in the state of Michigan. And those 55,000 jobs that are created by that uh, type of development, 10,000 of those should be set aside for people on public assistance, uh, our returning veterans, and people with long-term unemployment. Let's get this economy moving. Let's be the FDR of, the, of the, uh, this generation, and hopefully uh, we'll spur a lot of other economic growth as well. You can't bring industry into Michigan with bad schools and uh, bad roads, bad bridges, you know, bad infrastructure. We need to improve. We've got actually great schools and we should be talking about our greatness in our schools. Uh, I live in the Chippewa Hill School District. We've sent kids to, to Yale, to Notre Dame, to Michigan, to, to Central Michigan, to Ferris State University. We've done a wonderful job. And so does, you know, many of the other school districts all up and down the, the 102nd. We need to let teachers teach. We've got to stop running schools from the state legislature and start running them from our local school boards. What have they told you in particular that, they, that bothers them about that, as you, as you term it, the lack of local control? What, what areas of, uh, via curriculum or, or policy making and so forth, what are they hoping to see in terms of oh, number, perhaps garnering more local yeah, control? Number one, without question, is classroom size. We, we have 30 children in kindergarten, 31 kids in first grade, 31 kids in second grade. How are we gonna teach them to read under those conditions? Those classrooms should be 15 to 18 children, not 30 to 32. This is, this is an impossible situation. You can't reduce the funding for our schools by 16% and expect them to pr produce a child that can read and write and compete in our society. You can't, you can't reduce the, the spending at our universities by 30% in the last 10 years and expect progress. It just, it just doesn't work. Now, you know, if you take a billion dollars out of our K-12 education and give, it, and give it to private corporations, that will not solve the problem. We talk about charter schools. I'm opposed to profit-making charter schools. And the simple reason is it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. It hasn't improved our education. You know, we need to 
back our public schools. We need to back our public school teachers. We need them to receive the, the benefits uh, so that they can pass those down to our children. You mentioned the spending that's been called for, uh, whatever the final figure will be, long-term and, and sustainable funding for the roads. Did, did, what do the small business owners tell you in terms of how they have been held back or, or economic development folks in terms of attracting businesses when it comes to we've got an infrastructure problem and if we improved it, we might be able to do what? What are they, what are they thinking in terms of the economic impact that they could see? You know what the biggest I income uh, uh, impact could be? They'll expand. It's not so much bringing in uh, new industry from Illinois or from Indiana or wherever. They'll expand. They can expand in their markets if we give them better roads, if we give them better uh, regulation systems, if we, give them, if we look at the tax structure and make it fair to everyone. I want to rewrite the entire tax structure, Dave. If anybody that graduates from a Michigan high school can't understand our tax structure, then we've got corruption and we need to stop it. Our tax system is so complicated, there's very few people who truly understand it. And that affects small business. It affects small business more than it does the giant corporations who can hire them, the uh, massive legal staff to understand the tax structure. Do they support the removal of the personal property tax on business, or are they looking at other areas of that structure that they still see, business owners and the like, uh, or, or voters that, that say, we still have something that we don't. Well, when you talk about business with. owners, the biggest problem is, is confusion. The biggest problem is not sure where you are in the tax uh, structure. The personal property tax was that was an easy one. You know, it, you were double taxed. When I was in uh, owned the Remus Bowling Center, uh, I paid my six percent tax on those bowling on that equipment, and then I paid that personal property tax every year for forty years. You know, so that was good to to, to solve that issue. Okay. But we've got a bigger tax issue in this, in this state. We're giving multinational companies who send jobs overseas, we're giving them tax breaks. That's crazy. We must take care of our local businesses. You know, G George Washington uh, started with shopping at home, and that's what we have to do. We have to shop locally. We have to care about our local businesses. We have to care about the, our local industries. And that's going to make the difference. And when we have, you know, as you know, uh, with all of your experience, the, the amount of regulations that we have out here are staggering. And most of those regulations have been passed by lobbyists who were trying to stop free enterprise, trying to stop competition. They weren't trying to help it. You know, if there's a regulation out there that is sitting there hindering local business and doesn't protect the public, it should be eliminated. Which one specifically? We hear about levels of uh, regulations that have been in place either either from the economics or the tax structure or environmental regulations and the like. What are, what are some of those that, that you have pinpointed or again that the, the local uh, constituents have said to you would be tops on the list to go? Well, I don't think there's necessarily a list because every business, as you know, every business you go to has a different issue, okay? But the biggest problems that the local uh, businesses have is the complication and the amount of paperwork they have to do to comply with laws in the state of Michigan. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be the issue. The issue should be how can you help your customer, how can you help your own business grow, and that's what we're going to do. You talked about the investment needed in, in uh, the, the K-12 school system. Um, We've seen, because of the economic downturn, such a drastic shift when it comes to population, so many areas of the state that lost population over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, if we rewind all the way back to 93, 94, the way that Proposal A was implemented, does that plan still work? Do we need to tweak that? Do we need, what, what are the, what do school officials tell you when it comes to either the way we are paying for schools or the base uh, equitable funding per student? Well. Obviously, it doesn't work here in northern Michigan. You know, if you take our schools and, and look at the money behind our kids and then take a look at uh, Farmington Hills or take a look at, at Rockford or take a look at all sorts of other, you know, uh, wealthy communities, we lag behind. The idea was that all of those schools were going to be equal. We we're going to have an equal system in Michigan. That's what Proposal A told us, right, as voters. Didn't happen. It's not going to happen. We've got to sit down and rewrite the system. We've got to sit down and say, look, we have significant 
numbers of poor people in, 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 in uh, economically challenged ho homes in our districts, and it's not going to go away. You know, we need better job training, we need better education, we need you know vocational education, we need adult education. You know, back in the yeah, when I was uh, working in the poverty program way back in, in 68, 69, 70, our schools were humming with adult education at night. Those, those classrooms are closed today. That funding's gone away. You know, if you want to know what's going on in our schools, talk to your superintendents, talk to the principals, talk to the parents, talk to the teachers. There's just not enough funds for these schools to operate effectively, and they're teaching to a test. Why would we want the state of Michigan, the legislature, to design a test for our children? We need to have our educators and respect our educators at the local level to decide what those children need. What do they say about Common Core? They're against it, and I'm against it. I'm for common sense. We have to make sure that our kids are getting the education they need in the district they're in. And, that, and that we have to back our educators and understand our educators. You know, one thing about be, being my age, I've been to a few doctors. You know, and I didn't second guess them. I didn't decide to do my own operation. You know, we have to let our teachers tell us what they need, when they need it, and how we can help every one of them in their classes. And we need more local initiative, more creativity at the local level, and less at the state. In the last half minute that we have, you've identified uh, issues that, that um, many of our, our guests have done when it comes to jobs, when it comes to the infrastructure, when it comes to the schools. If you had that last moment that we have to leave the message with a single voter, he or she that's getting ready to go to the polls, what would that message be? My message is I'm going to work for you. I'm going to eliminate the, the, the senior uh, pension tax. I'm going to listen to the voter and find out what they truly believe is the best approach to take, and then we're going to take it. No, you know, I don't work for the governor. I don't work for any uh, legislator. I'm going to work for the people. We appreciate you taking the time to identify the issues and sharing that message, your plan for the campaign with all the voters in the 100 second. Thanks very much for taking the time. Well, thank you. And thank you for your time and attention as well. Here on Meet the Candidates, we've been talking to John Ruggles, Democratic candidate for the 102nd seat in the Michigan House. We urge all of you to go out and exercise your right to vote on Tuesday, November 4th. Thank you for joining us for Meet the Candidates. CMU Public Broadcasting invited both major party candidates for this office to participate in this series. Remember to go to the polls on Election Day. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas, joined this time by Representative Phil Potvin. He is the Republican representative for Michigan's 102nd district seat in the Michigan House, and he is seeking election to that office uh, for a third term. Representative, welcome back to our program. Good to see you. David, thank you very much. Real pleasure to be here today, and welcome to the listening audience. In our first couple of moments, we give all of our guests the chance to uh, provide some of that personal information, the background, your hometown, and uh, the experience that you bring to this campaign. Okay, thank you. Well, I live in Cadillac, Michigan, born in Alpena, Michigan. I uh, raised my family in Cadillac, Michigan. Uh, my wife and I had been married um, almost 47 years. Uh, we have four children married, all living in the great state of Michigan, and eight grandchildren. That's part of the reason that I got involved in this, this campaign. After selling my business, Western Concrete, which had been in operation for more than 60 years, well, 60 years right to the day, when my children told me, Dad, you know what? We want to do something else. And I said, well, thank you. Thanks for telling me. And we went out and did that, and I still have some property. And I thought, well, what better way than to improve the Michigan economy but to work hard to do that? And that's what I've been able to do these last four years, is work very hard representing rural northern Michigan. And that's what I'd like to continue to do. So it is time to refill 102. The 102nd district itself uh, includes uh, a couple of different counties, portions of another. Give us the, uh, the outline, the map yeah. of that 102nd. The outline is uh, all of Macosta County, basically the 131 corridor of Osceola County, and all of Wexford County. And that fits in so well for me, David, because I head up the Appropriations Committee for MDARD. 
the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. So when you put that together, MOW, MOO. For the district that you then have been traveling over the last several weeks and months and, and obviously running as an incumbent in this race, issues that you've identified, issues that the voters are telling you this time around that they see as key to 2014. Well, we always have a concern for education, and I do sit on both the education and I'm the vice chair of school aid committees on the appropriation side. So we've been working hard to grow that, and we have grown that. You know, with a new budget starting last week, October 1st, we've added $150 in the base foundation to all of our rural schools. And that's been great. So right now the rural schools are receiving more than $7,200 per student, which is a major growth when we look at it from a Michigan standpoint. The federal government, on the other hand, has backed off a little bit. And so we have picked up the pace to continue to do that in Michigan. And we've grown it all four years that I have been involved. First year was pretty flat because we came in with a, a hole in the budget. We filled that hole quickly, and uh, thanks to everyone working together, because that's what it's all about. I've been able to visit all of my rural schools, really like the month of March, because it's a reading month. And being a former teacher, I enjoy getting back in the classroom and saying hi. But I've also been in attendance with a lot of the school board meetings, again, to find out what's going on. And I meet with our superintendents on a quarterly basis for the 11 schools that I represent. Given the economic strains that Michigan has seen, uh, the population loss that the entire state has incurred really dating back to 2000 and, and some prior to that, does Proposal A still work as a funding formula? Are teachers, uh, leaders of the district telling you that it is a matter of more dollars, um, uh, stable dollars? What are they telling you when it comes to long-time hopes and, and needs for school aid funding? Well, a long-time hope would be to establish something <clears throat> more, more fixed, and that's exactly what we've been trying to do. The biggest challenge we have is that pension fund and keeping that pension fund filled. And the governor has reached out, as has our legislature, to uh, establish a way to pay that back. And we've set that up just like you would set up a home mortgage, and that home mortgage is due to be, be paid off in the year 2038. So it's a ways out, but you know what? We're planned for it, just like people plan for buying a home and how they're going to be paying for it. So we're paying every year and paying that down. The other thing we've been able to do is we've been able to fix the amount of dollars that schools have to come up with and are paying the other direct uh, as a state. Right now, that's almost a one-to-one. -one. Uh, the last rate was up at uh, well over 37%. And so with the fix at uh, just over 20%, that means uh, the state's putting in 17 cents out of every dollar uh, with the schools putting in the 20. So At the same time with the rural districts being more at the, the lower end, and we've seen this not only in your district but several others of the okay. candidates that we've spoken with from these areas where the further north you get, uh, you tend to have more districts at the bottom uh, portion of that uh, per pupil funding formula. Um, what are they telling you, especially when you have districts that are further spread out? What are sort of the, the, the additional concerns that they have towards taking care of the schools, meeting those challenges for our rural districts? Well, what we've been able to do this year specifically is add that $150 to the foundation for our rural schools and only $50 for the major schools in the urban areas that were receiving more dollars under Proposal A. So we're shrinking that gap, and that's the ongoing goal that we have, is let's bring that gap to even. And uh, naturally, the urban schools aren't happy with this, but at this particular point, we're providing the very same education that they provide, and the dollars should be as close as possible. And that's what we've been really working hard to do. I've been well-received. Uh, by my superintendents just because of standing up for that. And as the vice chair of school funding, I was the one who was the driver here to make sure that this happened. Very proud to be there. And having been in the classroom myself as my first career out of Albion College as a teacher, teacher of government and economics, uh, it's fun to be very involved in the education system in Michigan because we are reaching out. 
and reaching out in a very positive way. The other problem, especially in rural northern Michigan, is transportation. And uh, <clears throat> this winter, uh, I asked for another snow day opportunity, uh, only to be turned down, turned down by the state superintendent as well as turned down by our governor. And my question back to them was, when was the last time you provided a check for transportation? Uh, in Cadillac alone, we're over $6,000 a day just in transportation costs. When it comes to the rural nature of a district like this, you mentioned uh, your positions on, on uh, the agriculture uh, affiliated committees. Given the growth we've seen in agriculture, given the shrinkage we've seen in manufacturing, what are the economic challenges, concerns, opportunities that prospective voters, small businesses, the constituents have been sharing with you? Well, we really haven't seen shrinkage in manufacturing in my district. Uh, Big Rapids continues to grow with uh, Hayworth, with Wolverine, <clears throat> in Reed City, uh, Reed City Tool continues to grow. In Cadillac, we've got our 4,400 manufacturing jobs back in place again. Four Winds is back up and running very well. They've closed some of their other operations. The people at uh, Yoplait and Reed City, again, we're seeing Yoplait close another operation to keep Reed City in progress and, and moving forward. So from that end, it's all been good. Are Agriculture also or, uh... has, been, uh, has been growing too at the same, or at a better pace. And we continue to uh, look to good weather, pray to the Lord for that. And uh, all of these uh, early cold spells now are gonna make it a little tough to get that final cutting of hay, get, that, get the corn out of the fields before things freeze. So that becomes the challenge when we don't have the labor available. And so that's what we've really been reaching out for is, okay, how do we get more people involved in, in the labor of, of picking these crops and making sure that we've got them for market? Are there policies that they or uh, address attention to issues of regulation that they have um, said to you they would like to see should you be a, uh, elected to a third term, uh, any changes or modification moving forward to uh, the present way that we do business, whether it be through agriculture, manufacturing, other small businesses and the like? Not really. You know, we've been able to adjust uh, our tax base, which we did back in 11, removing the Michigan business tax and, and setting that up now as a 6% a if you make money. And also uh, any of the smaller businesses, constant encouragement there. Um, with no added tax and very little, if any, tax on those people. And we've also been handing out through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation added dollars to get people started again. The nice thing is I drive around through my district, Dave, is that I see stores being filled up again. People are coming back to work. People have smiles in their faces. Wow, that's exciting. When you think back on you know, when I was campaigning five years ago and the depression that we had here in Michigan and people leaving. Today, people are coming back to Michigan and it's exciting. Our houses are full, our contractors, because I was in the construction supply business at Western Concrete, they're back up again. People are working and they're working hard and they're also receiving an excellent wage. The other thing to keep in mind is when we talk about wages, we passed a minimum wage here in Michigan. And uh, so that did give people a raise in pay that uh, we're at the bottom. But in manufacturing, there aren't anybody there. There isn't anyone in that lower level. They're already above that level. The thing we're concerned about now, and their major concern is health care and this Medicaid uh, coming down from the feds and how it's going to be affecting everyone is a real challenge as we reach out. I think, you know, in Washington, they continue to try to, well, say, let's stop this. And the answer, I don't think, is in stopping it. It's already in process. What we need to do is come up with a better solution for how we can make this process function and function for all. And one thing that I'm looking at is a savings account, a health savings account, which would allow people to put money in as well as the uh, operator and, and uh, owner of the business to put dollars into this savings account. And if you move from one job to another, as so many people are doing now, David, they're able to take that account with them. And this to me makes a lot more sense than overcharging and uh, not giving people that opportunity because we know very well if people buy into something, they're part of it. 
And that's exactly what we want them to do. We want them to be part of this. In just a very few seconds that we have left then, if you had to leave a single message with a prospective voter in that 102nd district, what would be the message you'd want to leave with them as they get set to go vote? The message is that I really want to continue to be your state representative. One thing that I voted no on was the removal of the landlines for phones. And you know, we haven't seen enough cell towers come up. We have a lot of dead zones in our areas. And I want to be there for the next two years to make sure that we get more cell phones, more coverage. And I'm really concerned for our senior citizens because a lot of them are tied right into their phone for their health care. And it's way too important, being a senior myself, that we don't take care of these people and don't give them the safety and security that we've been able to give through the schools. I'm really excited about the fact that I was very involved in the OK to Say program, which added to my anti-bullying bill of 2011 for safety and security in our schools. Our kids are our most important piece coming up. So taking care of our kids, taking care of our seniors, and then our working class, Everyone's important to me in Michigan. Even though I represent the 102nd, I work for the entire state of Michigan. And I'm proud, very proud, to be your state representative and look forward to continuing to do that over the next two years with a good vote and a refill in November. We appreciate your time and attention uh, addressing all of the issues as we head towards that November vote. And good luck with the rest of the campaign. David, thank you very much. Thank all of you, listening audience, and please, please, Remember to vote on November 4th. We appreciate your time and attention here for Meet the Candidates. We've been talking with Representative Phil Potvin running for re-election in Michigan's 102nd District. And we echo that same sentiment for all of our guests and all of you to exercise your right to go out and vote on November 4th. This has been Meet the Candidates, a production of CMU Public Broadcasting. Both major party candidates were invited to participate in this series. For a complete listing of the air dates and times for this series, go to our website, wcmu.org.